you. Good morning. Good morning. That's it. They're going to wake you up. If you're not awake, we're going to wake you up. If that didn't wake you up, you're not awake yet. We're going to help you today. Good stuff happens when you put Jesus first in your life. This is what we've learned that this is not, Christ is not something that you compartmentalize your life and, and, and have a little piece of Jesus over here. Um, it's either the whole pie or it's nothing. You give him everything. And this is the way it works. And this is the way it will always work because, listen, we're talking about the creator of everything. So when we give the creator of everything a little piece of our hearts, we just don't understand. We clearly don't understand what this is all about. And today, we're looking at a topic that has the potential to be incredibly boring. Is that not exciting? We're talking about baptism today. But I'm going to make every effort to uncover what baptism is all about in such a way that it's interesting for you. And as I, as I really got down and started studying this, I learned so much stuff. I learned some really good stuff. I usually don't read my messages. I try not to read much because I don't like that. I like to kind of speak from what's going on here. But there's so, many, so much awesome information today. Forgive me. Extend me a little mercy. I'm going to read more than usual today. I just want to get these, the details right so that you can kind of have a picture. I got a picture of baptism as I studied this that I hadn't had before, to be honest with you. And I've been doing this ministry thing since I was 18, and I'll be 55 in April. And I'm learning things every month, every week, and every year. And I love this whole notion of when I was a new believer, there was this roller coaster kind of a thing in my life. Near to God, life is good. I'm telling everybody how to live. And then I'm down here on the bottom figuring out why am I here and how long will it last. And then I'm up here going, this is great. I, I don't think this will ever end. And three days later, I'm at the bottom again. And there was this roller coaster. And I think a lot of us, we can relate to this, right? We have these highs and we have these incredible lows. And what I've found over the years, as I seek God and put Him first, those deep inclines, steep hills and drops have leveled off, leveled off, leveled off. And what is supposed to happen in our lives is a steady incline towards God, a steady incline of not just mental understanding, but a deep heart for God. And I will tell you, I used to wonder, will it ever be steady? Will I ever have a steady walk? Will I ever get over my sin habits? Will I get, ever become unselfish? Will I ever get it right? And I will tell you today, I have witnesses that have watched me for 30-some years that have said, you know what, God's promises are true. It does level off. The crazy guy has become a little more predictable. The emotions have become more stable. The apologies are less frequent because they're not as necessary as they were. Probably one of the most powerful tools I ever learned as a follower of Christ, this magic word that un unlocked the hearts of people was, are you ready? It's a magic word. It's actually two words. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Would you forgive me? My behavior was not right. Would you forgive me? And I've learned to apply that to my family, to my friends, because I've learned, if I'm anything, I'm fallible. And when I humble myself, there's a grace there that's not there when I don't humble myself. So baptism. Baptism, if we were to capsulize or put a subtitle under this, it is, this is what the subtitle is, going public. Going public. Baptism is taking what's going on here and, and going public with it. Saying to everybody, hey, here's what's going on. I'm not ashamed. I want you to know. This thing is real for me. That's what baptism was about and is about. So we're going to go through this. This can be an emotional subject for people based on what denomination you were raised with. I was raised Baptist. Anybody raised Baptist in the room? That's your background? See, some of us, yeah. And see, the very word Baptist made me pretty sure we had the whole baptism thing down pat. We had it right. I mean, it was in our name, for goodness sake. We're Baptist. You know, we, surely Jesus was a Baptist. Surely John the Baptist was. But surely we, Paul, they, they had to be Baptist because we were Baptist. And we were pretty sure we were right about pretty much everything. And then I, had, I met some Catholic friends, and they were pretty sure they were right about everything. And then I had some Church of Christ friends who thought they were the only real believers, and they were pretty sure they were right about everything. And then I became, as I got further out into the world, and, you know, Presbyterians and Methodists, and I realized everybody kind of thought they had it. So what is it? What is the truth about these things, and specifically about baptism? My goal here today is to help us as a church and you as an individual follower of Christ understand the importance of baptism. Why is it important? And that if you're not a follower of Christ today, 
if you are a follower of Christ today and you've never been baptized, that you'll back up and say, I need to do that. And here's why I need to do that. At this church, baptism is going to be, as we develop more, we're a young church, we're five months old, baptism is going to be a big deal for us. It's going to be a big part of what we do. I'll tell you at the end of this message exactly what it's going to look like. But it's a big deal. And if we made baptism easier and we made baptism, we just lowered the standard. We might get more people, people baptized if we wanted to look at the numbers. But we're going to tell you what we believe is important and what baptism should look like. The reason we think baptism is so important is because of what Jesus said. At the very end of Jesus' ministry, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus makes this statement. And this is the end of his ministry. He's got his disciples there and his followers there. And so you've got to think whatever he says at the very end is going to be really important. So here's what he says. Go therefore, he's talking to his disciples who are following him, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That actually means all people groups, all types of people. And we have all nations right here in our community, don't we? All kind of people groups. Go and make their disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, you may wonder where did that come from, the, the Father the, and the Son. You may have thought church leaders just think that's a cool thing to say. We should add that. Sounds good, and it would be cool to dip them and say that. Let's do that. But actually, that's the formula. That's what Jesus said I want you to say. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Creator of all things, our Heavenly Father, and the name of Jesus, the Son. And that was actually heresy at the time when he said it because Jesus was claiming to be God himself, and that was kind of freaking people out. And then he said, I want you to baptize in the name of the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, we see the incredible power of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. So the idea of baptism is a thing that Christians in lots of denominations can agree on. But, you know, honestly, that's about where the agreeing falls apart. Because Christian denominations have fought over so many things over the years. And we even fight over how we baptize and when we should baptize. So I want to try to shine some light on that. And what I'm, the way I'm going to do this is we're going to look at historically how the Jewish people baptized, what it was all about, what the, where the word came from. We're going to take that historical view and we're going to combine it with the teachings of Jesus so we can at least get a perspective and understand it today. So I want to give you a little history. And then I'll teach you what Jesus said about it. And again, my agenda here today is that if you're a Christian and you've never been baptized, that you'll rethink that. That you'll step up and say, you know what, based on what the Bible says and what I want to do that. I want to identify myself with Christ. So, history of baptism. How many of you uh, like Greek? You like to study Greek? You like to know about Greek things? I see no hands. I see one hand and a couple of, yeah. Uh, Greek is interesting. Uh, my son Nate is at, at uh, YWAM School of the Bible, and he comes home and they're, teach, they're, they're taught they're, teached, they're taught to, to take the Greek and take it back to its foundational uh, understanding. They're, they, 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 they've learned to go in and, and dice, decipher what exactly is there. Now, why do they need to do that? Because we have Bibles that have done that for us, but not, the Bibles haven't done the best job. Not every Bible, not every word in each Bible has been translated correctly. And we'll see some of that this morning, exactly. And it wasn't because the translators or the scholars who did it were trying to be flawed. It's that the Greek language doesn't always translate well into the English language. For instance, the word love in our language has four or five different derivatives in the, in the Greek language, meaning different things. The original Greek word for baptism is pronounced baptizo. Baptizo. Isn't that pretty? Would you say that with me? Baptizo. See, now when people stop you on the street and ask you what it means, you can explain to them. It's pronounced baptizo, and that's going to make you smart. Just <laughs> I guess. Many of you know this. If you don't, it'll be news to you. The New Testament was written in Greek. That was a language that, that the scholars that took it out, that they, they wrote that in Greek. And so now you have modern-day scholars trying to translate that Greek into English. So when scholars get together and translate the Bible from Greek to English, they did what's called a one-to-one -one translation. They took a word in Greek, and they tried to find a word in English that best represented that word. So if it was a, a Greek word that meant hair, well, that's pretty easy. We can find an English word that means hair or foot or nose or whatever you're trying to describe. But the word baptize was not translated from Greek to English. It was what's called trans, transliterated from Greek to English. 
What's transliteration? That means instead of using the English equivalent for the word baptism, which there was no English equivalent for the word baptism, they took each letter from the, the original word baptizo, and they took that letter and found an English letter to make the translation. So the B in baptizo, they found the B. That is beta in Greek. It's B in English. Alpha was the next letter in Greek. They took that to English. And they came up with the word Z was zeta. They came up with the word baptize. That's how, that, that's how it happened. They simply took the Greek and they translated it. And they made an entirely new English word that was no longer there. It wasn't there previous, but is there now. This is what the Bible means when it says transliteration, when, you, when it transliterates a word, when the scholars did it. And in your, in your English Bible, there are several words that are handled this way because there was no English translation. So they found the best, or they, they took the letters and made a new word. But the problem was that in our English language, the word baptize always has a spiritual religious connotation, right? But in the original Greek, it did not originally have a spiritual connotation. In the first century, the word baptizo was not a religious word. It actually was a very common word, and it, it was very common, and it usually meant to wash, to plunge, to soak, or to dip. And throughout Greek literature, you'll find that word, baptizo, being used for uh, if a ship went down, it, it submerged or it plunged into the ocean, they would use that word. If somebody was taking a bath, they would use that word. If somebody drowned, they, might, they would use that word, and they would put words in front of it to give you more distinction. One of the most famous examples of this is in 200 B.C., a philosopher named Akendor wrote a recipe for, ready, for making pickles. Very important to know. The recipe survived the ages, and we can still find it today, and there's the recipe. He used the word baptizo twice. He said you take the vegetables and you baptizo it in boiling water, and then you baptizo it in vinegar. And then when the vegetable dies, it goes to heaven. <laughs> no, I'm making sure you're still with me. He's just using the word in a very common fashion because that's the way the word was used at that time. So here's where it gets complicated if it wasn't already. In your English Bible, the scholars sometimes translate the word baptizo as wash because that's what they're talking about. And sometimes they translate the word baptizo, they transliterate it, as baptized. So I'm going to give you two examples of this, all right? In Mark 7, 4, Jesus was, was talking about religious leaders, and, and, uh, and he says this, and when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. He uses the word baptizo. It continues, and then there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels. He's using the word baptizo there. Clearly, he's not talking about a ceremonial dipping of these things for religious purposes. They're just washing them. Then in Luke eleven thirty eight, 38, Jesus is talking about, he's talking about the Pharisees, and here's what he says. The Pharisees were, were astonished to see that he, Jesus, did not first wash. That's the word baptizo, before dinner. They were offended about that. They were talking about washing his hands, not a religious experience. So the question is this. How did this word that stood for a very common unreligious practice, washing, dipping, submerging, come to take on religious meaning. Why didn't Jesus, when he said, go and make disciples, say washing them, scrubbing them in the name? Well, he would, that would be ridiculous because that wouldn't have a, a, a spiritual connotation. That wouldn't be a, a religious thing. So he used the word baptizo. So here's how the common word baptizo began to take on spiritual meanings. And religious meanings. A long time before Jesus came on the scene. I'm going to set some history for you here. Back in the Old Testament, there was about a 400 year period between the New Testament and the Old Testament. During that time and sometimes a little before that, Gentiles, that's most of us by the way, those of us who were not born Jewish, Gentiles, would visit Judea and Jerusalem and Israel. And they would observe how these Jewish people lived their lives, and they were impressed. They compared it to the rest of the world, and, and they were very impressed. Their family units, their family seems to be happy. Uh, there seems to be an order that the, the rest of the world didn't have. There seemed to be a happiness and a purpose the rest of the world didn't have. And the Jewish lifestyle, when lived right, when lived before God, was actually very attractive. 
And these Gentiles would come into the Jewish world, they would observe it, and they, would want, they wanted it. And so they would hang out sometimes in the synagogues and they would worship, houses of worship, and eventually they would, they would contact the leaders and say, well, how do we Gentiles become Jewish? We want to we wanna be Jewish. Jews were the only, they believed in one God. They were the only monotheistic religion in the culture at that time and in that, in that time in history. And these Gentiles so admired the Jewish lifestyle and the religion, they wanted to be Jewish. It would, it's a lot like if somebody saw you at work and they saw the pressures of work that you're under because we all have those and they knew about your family, they knew that you didn't have an easy life, they saw the junker you drove, and, and they saw that you, you tried to prioritize, your, and they, but they saw a joy in you that others didn't have, and they saw a purpose and a confidence in you, and they want that, and it would be like somebody said, well, where's that from, and you invited them to your church, and say, you know, Jesus Christ is where that comes from, and I go to this church, and we meet together, and I, yeah, I'd come sometime and check it out, and, and they come and see, and they go, I want that. It's, it's much the same that was happening at that time. The process, what happened was, the Jewish leaders decided, we really want to incorporate these people. We want them to experience the Jewish experience. I didn't know this at the time. I've heard of this over the years, but this was, this was happening at that time. So the Jewish leaders came up with five rules of process that if you wanted to be, if you were a Gentile, you wanted to become a Jew and experience the God, the Judeo God, then there were five things you had to do. And these were kind of, over the years, they kind of solidified this. The very first one is, is really fun. The very first one is circumcision. <laughs> That's circumcision. I, I don't have to explain it. I think I would go into detail, but really no necessary. That's the result. Circumcision. But if you wanted to be a Jew and you were not, you would have to step up and say, I'm willing to do this. This is the reason there were many more female converts to Judaism than there were males. Number two, you had to have a covenant meal. Now, the covenant meals were, were meals that remembered the Passover. They remembered key events in the history of the Jewish people. When God do his, would do something powerful and special, they would have this covenant meal to remember that. And you would have to go ahead and say, I'm going to partake in these covenant meals. The third one was that it was pretty, it's a big one. You had to acknowledge the Old Testament law. You had to, to surrend, submit your life to the law of Moses, which means you had to change everything. You had to walk away from the pagan religions that you'd been a part of, and even sometimes the families that you'd been a part of, because they did not accept this. And you would have to take this new law of Moses and apply it to your life. It was a big deal. The fourth thing was a sacrifice. You would have to make sacrifices. These, these animals that they would sacrifice to atone for their sins. You had to make that a part of your life. And that was, that was actually, as history records, it was different in different times of, of history in the Jewish life. And then the fifth one is what we're looking at today. It's where we get all this from. You had to agree to a ceremonial washing. Now, this is something that you would do alone. This wasn't a public thing. That's going to matter to understand it in just a minute. This was a very private thing between you and God you would have this time where you would wash and you would follow these rules. And there, were more than, there was more than one ceremonial washings. And you would wash and you would say, I, I, I walk away from my old lifestyle, my old way of life. And I am identifying in this ceremonial wash between me and God. I'm identifying myself with Judaism, with the God of Israel. And that's what the ceremonial wash was about. Now, the term that they would use to describe this ceremonial wash you guessed it. it. It was baptizo. That was the word they used to describe this. This was before anybody's being baptized in the Christian faith. This was the word they used to describe it. They would put an adjective in front of it to identify what kind of ceremonial washing it was. So people would know that this term was a religious term rather than just a washing the dishes or the pots or the pans or a ship going down or someone drowning. So there's the background, all right? I gave you all that. And with this as background... And about 30 A.D., something really crazy happened. Something came on the scene that had never been there before, freaked some people out, but enlightened a lot of other people. In 30 A.D., a wild-eyed, crazy man, barefooted, smelled like he had never had a bath in his life, dressed in animal skins, and ate bugs. 
came on the scene. And he did something nobody else did. The Jordan River was a common place. Imagine if we had one big lake in our community, and it was where everybody went and hung out. And kids would play in the water, and people would picnic, and it was just hundreds and even thousands of people around this area. This guy showed up, and he would go down to the Jordan River, and he would teach, and he would preach. And he had a message that was very unique from other messages, and it was a very simple message. His message was this. Repent. He would stand on the shore and holler to the people in the water and on the, on the shore. Repent. Repent. And they knew that word meant change your mind. Change your life. Stop what you're doing. Repent. Okay, what's the rest of your message? Repent. What was his message. Anybody know this guy's name? First guy's, his first name was anybody? John. We know that it was John. And John said that God was about to do a new thing. God was about to do a new thing that, if you, that had never been done before and that if, if you were right with God, you would see it. But if you were not right with God, you would miss it. If you were not right with God, you would not see it. You wouldn't comprehend it. God's going to show up in our midst, John said. The kingdom of God is here. God's going to show up in our midst, and if you're not right with me, you're going to miss it. That was John's message to the people. Not popular with some, very interesting and very, very moving to others. He, said, he would say, I know you're Jewish. I know you follow the laws. I know you have the sacrifices, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a whole new thing, a whole new relationship, a whole new connection with God. And that was very intriguing to people. And John had an authority about him. When you read this, even the Pharisees would go out. They were so impressed with the authority that he spoke with. Eventually, they, they hated him for this authority because they didn't have it. But he spoke with such intensity and such authority from God and such understanding that it was moving for people. I know you're Jewish. I know about your sacrifices. But that's not it. And then he did the strangest thing. He did something that had never been done before in the history of the Jewish people. He went down into the river, stood, I imagine, about waist deep and said, if you agree with my message and you're ready to repent, to receive the kingdom of God, come down here into this water. And people lined up. And what happened next was very unusual. They came down into the water, and John took them through some kind of a ceremonial washing. Now, as a Baptist, I'm pretty sure I thought I knew what that washing was. He dipped them in the water, right? He lowered them into the water and picked them back up, because that's what we do. But you don't see the exact evidence of, of how he did what he did. When I was a kid, I, I watched a Jesus movie when I was like 12, and when Jesus, uh, John was in the river baptizing people, he was throwing water at them. He was picking up and splashing them. And it really offended me. <laughs> Who wrote this silly movie? And Who didn't get it right? And come to find out, you don't get the details. You don't see exactly how he it did was. It was a ceremonial washing. And that the people who described it, who had never seen it before, they used a word, and you know what the word is. They used the word baptizo. It's the only thing they could think of. They, they connected the fact that washing with water with baptizo and then this Jewish experience, uh, this Gentile experience to become a Jew became a, a religious ceremony. The only word they had that described it adequately, so they used the word baptizo. They knew that he wasn't washing their dirt off of them. He wasn't scrubbing them and whistling. They knew that it was more than that. They knew that it was something spiritual and religious, but that was the word that they used to identify it. This was something completely new. And that's where John got the nickname John the Baptist. John the Baptizer, actually. And here's what's really interesting. This derivative of the word baptizo, the way they said it, the adjective they put before it, had never been used before. And from that time on was only used in a Christian context. 
the derivative of that word from that time is when it started and from that time it's only been used in Christian literature and in a Christian context. The term originated in the Greek New Testament. This tells us that when people saw what John was doing, they didn't have a word for it. No one had ever ceremoniously washed another person. Remember, it was something you did alone. When you did the ceremonial washing, it was very private. It was very intimate. It was between you and God. And now there's guys out there ceremonially baptizing people. And now it shows that this is not something that you can do yourself. There's, there's more involved. Instead of you pursuing God with all of your sacrifices and all of your law, now suddenly God is pursuing you. God has made a way for you. And the kingdom of God is coming. Get ready for it. The only time you ever see this Greek terminology is when it's associated with Christianity in the first century. That's when it began. And it wasn't enough. Now, just get the picture. People are lined up. Paul's baptizing people. And it wasn't enough for people to stand on the shore going, Amen! Yes! Good, good message! Like ya! It wasn't enough. Paul would look at him and say, You! Repent! Come! Be washed for your sins! Be Identify with my message. You, you like it? Come down here. That was very different because it was no longer private. You couldn't walk away having privately done this. Now you have just proclaimed to everybody in the river that you believe this was true. And if everybody in the river saw it, you got to know the whole town would be talking the next day. Did you know that Dr. So-and-so went in the bathroom? Do you believe that? He's following this crazy, wild-eyed, stinky man. John would say, no, standing up there is not enough. You come down and you identify with this. You make it public. And that's the key here, this baptism. You make it public. And then one day, John is baptizing a lot of people. And in the middle of it all, something happens to him and to everybody watching that was monumental and historically had never happened. And it changed everything. He's baptizing people, and suddenly he stops. And he looks up on the shore, and he sees someone. And I can just imagine how overwhelmed he became. Because he sees someone, and I believe he hears from God in that moment. I believe God just almost takes him to his knees, and he says, Look! And everyone, he stops. Everyone stops talking. Everyone looks. He says, Look! Behold! Behold! Look! Everybody stop! Look! Behold! The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. All that I'm saying to you about repenting, it culminates in that guy, that guy there. And then Jesus does something unusual, unexpected. Jesus comes down into the water and says to John, I need you to baptize me. John's reaction is, I can't. I'm not worthy to baptize. I'm not worthy to tie your sandals. But Jesus allows, needs actually, John to baptize him to identify with this message of repentance. Jesus is affirming to everyone watching, this is important. This matters to God. So that's how baptism got launched. That's the historical connection. That's where it all began. So when Jesus tells his disciples, at the very end of his ministry, I want you to go into the world, go to all people groups, teach them the truth. I want you to proclaim the gospel, and I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about. Baptism is a public declaration of a new association. I'm going to now, even against the odds of my culture, I'm going to associate myself with this guy, with this religion, with this faith. And baptism is a public declaration of a new association. And that's kind of different in our our culture. See, at that time, if you were to walk up and be baptized in that lake, so many people would see it. It was very quick news. I mean, the Jerusalem Times probably had it on the the second page the next day. So-and-so, do you believe this? And it began to build with enthusiasm and build with, uh, with, with um, build momentum as more and more people began to be baptized and repent. 
It was a very, very public thing. Baptism is also a personal declaration. It's a personal declaration of something that's happening in you, something that has happened. And you're saying to yourself and to God, it's kind of like that washing. It was personal between you and God, and it was declaring to yourself and to God, I am with you, I stand with you. But the baptism was public. So if you're a Christian and you've never been baptized, understanding why it was so important to God, why it was so important that Jesus said it at the very end of his ministry, it ought to matter to you. And I hope after hearing this message, you'll say, man, I've I got to do that. I want to do that. Baptism is not a condition of salvation. It is actually evidence of a salvation. Now, the question rises up, and it has to, what do you do if somebody believes but they don't have time to be baptized? They are, they're taken off this earth before they're baptized. What if a little child dies? You know, in the Catholic Church, how many of you heard the word limbo? You know the word limbo. We know that word. If you're in limbo, you're kind of hanging out. Not, you know, you're between this and that. You know, that's a word that derived itself in the Catholic Church. It's a word that if, if they tried, to, they, they created, and we do this in, in churches. We create our own theology. And it has nothing to do with the, the, the scripture, but we create our own theology to explain things that we don't fully understand. So we, then we try to take our theology and explain it. We go dig it and try to find scriptural words. We'll pull them out of context so we can describe what we think is... Is, and the Catholic Church came up with this, this thought of limbo. And limbo was between heaven and between hell. And if children died before they had a chance, then it would go into limbo. And you, there are more teachings that the Catholic Church and other churches have come up with that just don't have any foundation in Scripture. Well, what happens then if a little child? We see all the evidence in Scripture, the love and mercy of God, that, that leads us to clearly know that God is not going to punish a little child because they died too soon and couldn't understand. Clearly, you understand that? And then you have to ask yourself, but what if, what if a person has given their life to, what if a person has believed in Christ and is following Christ, but they've never been baptized? They didn't have an opportunity. Nobody, you know, there are cultures that the water is just too cold. You'll die if you go out and dip in that water. There are, there are times that the, there is no water to be baptized in some cultures and history. And what do you do with that? Oh, well, sorry. No, my goodness. Baptism is not a condition of salvation. It is an evidence of salvation. And if somebody wants to argue with it, I, would, I suggest to our people, don't argue with people. If somebody's so bent that they're going to argue with you, you're not going to convince them. We are to love people. We're to understand his word, but not to go around hammering people with it. We're to teach the truth when someone has ears to hear, and we're to love people. But... But if someone just insists, you have to be saved, you simply say to them, well, what about that poor criminal on the cross beside Jesus? Because he must have woken up in hell and been very disappointed since Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And all the guy did was look over, and we've said this so many times from up here. He just looked over and he just said, Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? That is all he said. And Jesus' words back to him were not, I am so sorry. We just don't have the time to baptize you. <laughs> and Jesus looked over and said something that had to amaze the crowd. This criminal on the cross who had clearly lived a life of crime, and that's why he was there. The criminal never once said, I'm falsely accused. He was there. He knew why he was there. History records he was a criminal. And Jesus looks over and says, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. This very day, what you're asking is going to happen. Wow. Baptism is not a condition. It's an evidence. We're not hung up in this church on form. We're really, we're not hung up on how it's done. We're hung up on when it's done, the timing, when it's done. Does somebody understand what's going on? When I was like eight or nine years old, I was in a little Baptist church. And the guy preaching scared, can I say it, scared the hell out of me. And that's what he was intending to do. He wanted to scare the hell out of you. The hell, scare you to heaven. Scare you away from hell. And it worked for me. I was a little kid, and it scared me so badly that I went up there. I don't even know if anybody else was going, had gone up there. But I went up there. 
and he was a Baptist evangelist. The guy was really good. I think it was Moody Adams. I, and I thought the guy was, he was a Cajun, raging Cajun from New Orleans, and the guy could preach. And I went up fearful, and I got baptized. And I remember we went out to, I believe, out on, uh, in South Fork, when you're going out to Tropical Farms, there's a little creek there, and we were baptized in the creek. And, you know, honestly, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I just didn't want to go to hell. And my friends did it, and it became kind of cool. We would get out of the water and go, whoa, it was cool, wasn't it cool, yeah. Then when I was 16, someone preached the message of Christ, and I got it. I understood it. And it unraveled my heart. And I remember thinking at 16, I need Jesus so bad. And I went forward and knelt down in a, in a room full of teenagers. And I, I might have been the only one that night and just said, Jesus, be my Lord. God, forgive me for my sins. And, and then, I wanted, then I understood what baptism was about. And I wanted my friends to know. And I wanted the high school, Martin County High School, to know. I wanted them. I was a Christian now. And I wanted to identify with Christ. And I didn't want to play it safe. You know what I mean? Yeah, we play it safe. I'm going to do that, but nobody will know until I can slowly let them know. I wanted to just go big guns into this thing. And so I, I was baptized in front of this church. And in this church, there had to be about 30 to 50 high schoolers that were a part of Morgan High School that knew me, and now the word was out. So, heck, I started bringing my Bible to school. Not to prove a point, because I kind of liked to read it at the time. And I began to identify myself on a daily basis with Christ. And it changed how people viewed me, and it changed how I responded to people. And I now was making myself accountable. I wasn't hiding away in an easy Christianity. Do you understand what I'm saying? Baptism was a part of that. So when we baptize at Life Church, we're going to do a thing called the declaration video. All right? Or, or the, the going public video. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a baptism service soon. We're going to announce it. You call, you sign up. We're going to take people down probably on the ocean, and we're going to baptize people. We used to go to the bathtub, but we're going to find a place that's not the bathtub since we can't go there anymore. And we're going to videotape this. And we're going to videotape you telling this church what's going on here. And it may be very simple. All I know was... I, I felt compelled to go pray to God and Jesus, make him my Lord. That's all I know, and I want to. It may be that simple. You may have a story to tell. More often than not, people don't realize it, but when they begin to talk about where they were and where they're at now in that short term, they have a story to tell. So we're going to videotape that and show it. And not only that, it'll be available. You can go find it on YouTube, and it'll be on the World Wide Web for all to see. So you can send out... Facebook and I was like, hey, watch my video. I was baptized. Here's what I said. Or you can send emails to people with the URL address and it'll be an opportunity for you to make public, to go public with what's happened, happened in here. We're going to do that. Now listen, if, if you've been baptized in another church and, and you are a follower, we're not going to you know, make you, you know what I'm saying, we're not going to hound you on that at all. And if you are really, 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 really uncomfortable with being videotaped, um, here, because you don't know us, you know, do it. Get a friend to do it. Just kind of say, get a cell phone, you know, and just you know, here's here's what happened. I'm going to follow Christ in baptism. That's all, and we'll and we'll show that. But we want to do that. We want to give you that opportunity, and we don't want you. You don't want to rob the people. Here's what happens when people begin to to say on tape what happened. They don't even realize just what's happened until they begin to talk about it, and it is such an an encouragement for people who don't yet know, but who hear what you have to say. So many people say, well, gosh, I just have the same old story. I mean, it's the same thing everybody says. I was lost, and now I pray, and now I'm better, and, and I have this hope in Christ, and now here's what I know, and it's the same story. And see, isn't that the point? Isn't that the point that a world who doesn't know about Christ we haven't rehearsed this thing together, but people in China and Japan and Indonesia are all saying the same thing. I was lost and I'm found. I was blind and I can see, simply put, or then you go into detail, my life was like this. And that is what the world needs to see. And those who don't know Christ need to hear that. So I would strongly encourage you, don't rob people of that. So we're going to offer you opportunity the next week to sign up and to be baptized. Baptism is a public expression. So we're going to use a video to make it that. 
See, it's all about what Jesus has done for you. It's all about what he's done for you. And I believe that he wants to begin that at the moment you're ready to begin that. For me, it was 16. Now, heres I believe this is true. When I was nine years old and I went forward, there was something, and I remember there was something in me that wanted to be protected by God because I was such a disaster on wheels. I was a kid who would run into walls just to see how it would feel, you know? Run my bike off of bridges, and I did it. I can take you to bridges in Salerno. I would ride my bike off of the bridge into the river. I mean, I, I risked my life at, when I got a car, oh, dear Lord. And so I had this sense when I was nine, yeah, amen, somebody said, when I had this sense when I was nine that I needed God, but I didn't fully understand the thing. So when I went forward, I'm not devaluing that. When a nine-year-old says, I have trusted Jesus as my Lord, I, I believe that. I know people, my wife didn't, didn't tell you when she, was, when she actually prayed to receive Christ. She just knew as a child, she knew the 23rd Psalm, and it meant so much to her, and she grew up with this love for God, and she's following Christ. She began to follow Christ, and just didn't Jesus say, follow me? Isn't that, wasn't that the criteria for being saved? Follow me? Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me? So we're going to invite you to do that today. If you're here and you're not a Christian, and you've never followed Christ, you've ever prayed to God in Jesus' name and, and just invited him into your life, we're going to give you an opportunity for that. The band's going to come up. They're going to play a song, and it'll just probably be just a few minutes. Uh, we don't high-pressure you, but we're just going to offer you two things. An opportunity to pray to receive Christ, an opportunity to follow Christ today, number one, all right? And then number two, we're going to offer you an opportunity. If you have a need, a prayer need, I can't tell you the people who come up here with prayer needs. And sometimes it's week after week after week with the same need until we see an answer because we believe prayer is powerful and persistent prayer is powerful. Sometimes people come the very next week with an answer. Often that happens. So you have a family member, your own heart, something in your life, a job, something. We highly value. We'll have some people up here that will pray for you. We'll have some ladies and some men up here. I'll be one of them. So feel free, if you'll stand right now, these guys will sing a song. If you want someone to pray with you, come on down. It's, you never come down too much.